Hi, I'm Jeffrey, and welcome back to Night Falls. Join me around the campfire at the foot of these mystical falls for a podcast of bedtime stories designed to help you sleep. Each week, we'll begin with a brief meditation before settling into our story for the evening. And don't worry if you fall asleep before the end. I want you to drift off whenever you're ready. Are you enjoying your visits to Nightfalls? If you are enjoying my stories, please leave a review and let me know. Come, take a pew beside the fire and I'll tell you of the famous detective Sherlock Holmes and the mystery he simply couldn't help but get wrapped up in his first few weeks of retirement. As the world's greatest detective tries to wind down and live life at a slower pace in his retirement, why don't we take a moment to wind down and relax too? Come to a comfortable position your head and neck dropping back into alignment, your limbs lengthening and loosening. Feel the muscles of your abdomen releasing and your chest gently rising and falling to the tune of your breath. Inhaling, feel your lungs opening up as the fresh air flows into your body and drifts beyond your lungs to settle into the very core of your being. Exhaling, notice the stress and strain of another long day draining from your body. Inhaling deeply once more, feel the air flowing beyond your abdomen and sinking deeper still. Exhaling, Sigh out in relief as you sink into relaxation. Sherlock Holmes has impeccable instincts, but good instincts are not born of intellect. They're a sense that's settled into your gut. Perhaps the detective's true gift is in listening to his body. Lying there relaxing, Consider the fact that, however studious or smart your conscious mind is, your body will always be more intelligent. Every passing second, your incredible body absorbs thousands of details from your environment, more detail than the brain can even begin to process. In listening to your body, in breathing deep, and paying attention to how you feel, you too can tap into that animal intuition that lies within us all. Drawing in a deep breath, feel the connection between your being and your body beginning to strengthen. Breathing out, release any negative beliefs you hold about your physical form about the body that constantly gathers information to guide you, sustain you, and help you thrive. Feel a sense of confidence and trust for your body, your intuition washing through you. Now, if you're feeling relaxed, Sherlock's adventure can begin. The hotel he was residing in was exemplary. It had been recommended to him by his landlady, Mrs. Hudson, who had stayed here a few times. Yes, all was well, apart from that one thing. It was none of his business, not his concern at all. However, it was bothering him somewhat. A noise outside his door 
caused him to look away from the window. And there it was again. The heavy tread of a shoe where there used to be a light step. That small sigh where once there had been a happy song. And a solitary knock at the door had replaced the joyful double tap of previous days. Come in, Mrs. Pemberton, Sherlock called out to the landlady and owner of Inglewood View Hotel. Mrs. Pemberton came into the room, carrying a breakfast tray. Sherlock noticed the tiredness in her eyes, one which had been present for days now. She placed the tray on the table and asked about his plans for the day. Her smile looked a little forced. He gave in to his curiosity and asked Mrs. Pemberton what was bothering her. She attempted to wave his concerns away, but he gently explained how talking about a problem often helped to provide a solution. And so, Mrs. Pemberton explained what was vexing her. It was her younger sister, Lizzie. She worked as an usherette at the local picture palace. The palace was a wonderful building, Mrs. Pemberton added with a wistful smile. And you felt like you were walking into another world, one full of magic and glamour. Mrs. Pemberton continued with her tale. Lizzie worked several shifts, the first one starting just before noon. She had a break around 4pm before starting another shift in the evening. Mrs. Pemberton thought her sister worked too hard, but Lizzie wouldn't listen to her concerns. The thing is, Mr. Holmes, she's a lot younger than me, and I've been more like a mum to her over the years than a sister. I need to make sure she eats well, so I insist she comes here between shifts. I make her an afternoon tea and we have a good catch-up over sandwiches and cake. I always make gingerbread because Lizzie loves it so. It's an old family recipe. I make plenty and she takes some with her to eat on the evening shifts. She stopped talking and fiddled with the edge of her sleeve. Sensing Mrs. Pemberton was attempting to gather her composure, Sherlock insisted she sit down. Once she was seated, he poured her a cup of tea and placed it into her hands. She gave him a grateful smile. Sherlock asked her to continue talking. She stopped eating, Mr. Holmes. Well, not completely. She does eat something, but she picks at it. And as for the gingerbread, she barely touches it. She doesn't take any with her. That has never happened before. She's lost her appetite, Mr. Holmes. And that can only mean one thing. Something is troubling her. And it's troubling you too, Sherlock observed. I assume you've asked her what's wrong. Mrs. Pemberton confirmed she had. But Lizzie claimed nothing was amiss. But Mrs. Pemberton knew her sister was lying. Because Lizzie wouldn't meet her eye when questioned. And that was always a giveaway that the truth was being withheld the landlady said. Sherlock agreed. Mrs. Pemberton put the cup down, stood up and smoothed down her dress. She apologised for taking up his time over such a trivial family matter and said she better get on. She had a million and one things to do. Before Sherlock could say another word, she swiftly left his room, closing the door firmly behind her. Sherlock returned to the window 
and mulled over her words. Even though he'd only known Mrs. Pemberton a short while, her organized manner, thoughtful ways and kind words had made a good impression on him. And this mystery about her sister intrigued him. But he'd retired from the detective business. He'd put it all behind him. His focus went to the view in front of him and the pier which took pride of place in the very centre of Inglewood Bay. The picture palace where Lizzie worked was at the end of the pier. Perhaps he could take a stroll towards it, and if by some chance there was a film playing which caught his eye, he could go inside and watch it. And if Mrs. Pemberton's sister was there, he would only be polite to start up a conversation with her. There'd be no harm in that. No harm at all. Sherlock had planned to walk along the coastal path to the lighthouse today, but the thought of a mystery was much more appealing. He smiled to himself. It seemed a detective never truly retired. Leaving his rooms a short while later, Sherlock walked along the promenade. He tipped his hat in greeting to those residents who were already becoming familiar to him. The smartly dressed retired major, with his flamboyant moustache and his formal salute of a greeting to everyone he passed. A group of uniformed nannies, expertly manoeuvring their silver cross perambulators along the path, simultaneously chatting to each other whilst keeping a dutiful eye on the small wards inside their carriages. Elderly ladies regally dressed in fashions from the last century and looking as if they didn't care for those drop-waisted dresses which the younger women were wearing. Sherlock sauntered along the pier, admiring the ornate iron railings and smooth floorboards beneath his feet, through which came glimpses of the swirling sea below. The gift shop caught his attention. He'd promised Watson and Mrs. Hudson he would send regular correspondence from his seaside residence. And he'd been as good as his word and sent detailed letters every few days. Perhaps it was the warmness of the day or the pleasant sound of the sea lapping over the sand or even the friendly face of the young man behind the counter. But Sherlock felt the impulse to purchase a couple of vibrant postcards with the cheerful message of wishing you were here printed on them. A wry smile alighted on his face as he bought them. If Watson and Mrs. Hudson were here, they wouldn't take kindly to him investigating a mystery when he was supposed to be taking things easy. Furthermore, they wouldn't appreciate it was a mystery for which he wouldn't be paid. But solving it would be sufficient compensation for him. His thoughts turned to the conundrum in mind. In his wisdom, he considered he already knew why Lizzie Pemberton may have lost her appetite. He'd come across other cases like this in his time. The answer was a simple one. Lizzie must have found herself in a romantic entanglement of some kind, the kind which caused a person to lose interest in food. He nodded to himself. Yes, that was the most likely cause. He would discreetly talk to Lizzie and discover what, or whom, was behind her lack of appetite. Perhaps he'd be able to assist her somehow. But only if Lizzie requested his help. Satisfied the mystery had already been solved, Sherlock made his way past the row of shops and cafes on the pier until he reached the picture palace. It was an impressive sight 
with its facade of cream-coloured curved arches, red bricks and dark oak doors. The brass handles had been polished to perfection, and recently too, going by the absence of any fingerprints on the metal. Sherlock entered the building and stepped onto the thick red carpet. Mrs. Pemberton's earlier words came to him. Her comments about walking into another world full of magic and glamour. That's exactly what it felt like. A wide, open staircase faced him. Elaborately curved banisters at either side. The opulent carpet continued up the steps. Shining brass carpet runners holding it in place. Large posters in gold frames gave the promise of future attractions which would delight and entertain any film enthusiast. Not having visited many picture palaces, Sherlock was unaware who some of the actors were, but he admired how they were dressed in such an eclectic mix of costumes. He paid for his ticket at the booth and was told about the films which were about to start, including the latest one from Charlie Chaplin. Ah, now there was a name he recognised. Who didn't know about the great comic genius? Sherlock was shown into the theatre by a smiling usherette, dressed in a smart navy blue velvet jacket and trousers which were embellished with gold braids. The lights were dimming, so the usherette used her torch to illuminate his way to the third row from the front. As Sherlock took his seat, he observed the other patrons in the auditorium. There were nine of them, all sitting in the rows ahead of him and at a respectful distance from each other. The red velvet curtains on the elevated stage moved to the sides with a quiet swish to reveal the screen behind. The moving of the curtains caused a slight breeze, and that breeze brought a faint aroma of something familiar towards Sherlock, a smell which reminded him of a case he'd worked on years ago. But what was it? The memory was just out of reach and vanished before his mind could take a firm hold of it. The scent disappeared into the ether, and Sherlock forgot all about it as he got lost in the entertaining antics of Mr. Chaplin. Intermission time soon rolled around. The lights came up, and a couple of usherettes holding trays walked down the aisles. Lizzie Pemberton was one of them, Sherlock walked over to her and looked at the tempting array of chocolate bars which filled the tray. Having met Lizzie a few times at the hotel, he greeted her by name and struck up a conversation. He intended to turn their talk to matters of the heart, which would hopefully lead to the reason behind Lizzie's diminished appetite. Feeling confident, Sherlock expected her answers to confirm that, yes, she was involved with a new bow, and yes, the relationship had affected her appetite. But her answers didn't go that way. She explained how she was in a long-term relationship with a gentleman called Patrick, and there was talk of an engagement on the horizon. Changing tact, Sherlock talked about Mrs. Pemberton's baking skills and, in particular, how delicious her gingerbread was. Didn't Lizzie agree? And that's when the situation got interesting. At the mention of gingerbread, Lizzie averted her gaze and shifted from one foot to the other. Even though there were customers behind him, Lizzie abruptly turned around, walked back along the aisle, and disappeared through the doors at the end. What was it about Mrs. Pemberton's gingerbread 
which had upset her so. He wandered back to his seat, whereupon that intriguing aroma returned to him. Where was it coming from? And what was it? He sat down and inhaled gently. It was a spice. Of that he was certain. He cleared his mind and let the memories come to him. It was seven years ago. He was following up a lead on a mother of pearl necklace which had been taken from the home of a duchess. His investigation had led him to some unfamiliar back streets in London, which were dotted with bakeries, selling a mouth-watering array of goods. So tempting was the smell that he'd stopped at the nearest bakery and bought an assortment of food, which he'd later shared with Mrs. Hudson and Watson. It had been Mrs. Hudson who'd remarked on the addition of a certain spice in one of the sweet loaves, and how it was unusual to have nutmeg at a time other than Christmas. As his memory of that time intensified, he realised it was indeed nutmeg which was scenting the air. He glanced at the people in front of him. The fragrance was coming from one of them, but he could hardly move amongst them inhaling as he went. It wouldn't be polite. Some instinct told him he needed to discover the source of the nutmeg. Why? He didn't yet know. But the answer would reveal itself in due course. The next film began, and for a short while, Sherlock was lost in the action. But his attention soon drifted to the other people in the cinema, and he wondered why they were here at this early hour. He looked at the young man on the next row. He was wearing a pressed shirt and linen trousers. His hair swept back with not one strand out of place. The way he kept looking at his watch made Sherlock wonder if he were expecting company. Perhaps a date? Had the poor chap been let down? Or maybe he was passing time until he did meet up with a lady friend. There was an elderly woman sitting at the end of the row in front of him. A friendly-faced woman, possibly in her seventies, who had a wicker basket on her lap, covered in a checked tablecloth. She aimed a smile at everyone who caught her eye and mentioned the clement weather as though hoping to start up a conversation with them. On the front row, an elderly chap was wrapped up snugly in a thick coat, despite the warmth inside the building. Maybe he felt the cold more than others and needed to keep warm. Sherlock had noticed his head lolling to one side now and again, giving the suggestion he had fallen asleep. Sherlock stayed inside the picture palace for a few more hours. He was hoping to speak to Lizzie again before he left but she was nowhere to be found. He returned to the hotel, feeling a little despondent. He hadn't told Mrs. Pemberton he would attempt to solve the mystery of Lizzie's appetite, but he'd been hoping to present her with a fait accompli, thus leading to an improvement in Mrs. Pemberton's spirits. Alas, it wasn't to be. At least... Not for that day. But retirement or not, Sherlock Holmes did not give up easily. He would solve the mystery, somehow. He headed to the dining room to place his order for his evening meal. He came upon an interesting scene. Mrs. Pemberton and her sister were sitting at the table near the bay window, a veritable spread of a feast between them. Despite the treats on offer, neither woman was eating. There was a heavy silence in the air, with unspoken words on the lips of both women who glanced at each other frequently before looking away. Sherlock cautiously moved forward 
unsure of what to say, but knowing he had to say something. Before he got the chance to speak, the smell of nutmeg came to him. Mrs. Pemberton, he began, may I inquire, have you been baking with a nutmeg? Nutmeg, Mr. Holmes, at this time of the year, I only ever use it at Christmas, and even then, I use it sparingly. Why are you asking me about nutmeg? Lizzie was staring intently at the carpet, as though it was the most fascinating floor covering she'd ever seen. And then, it all became clear to Sherlock. He told the sisters how he'd experienced the same smell of nutmeg in the cinema, and he now suspected it had come from the friendly-faced woman who'd had a basket on her lap. He suspected it was filled with baked goods flavoured with the spice. At the mention of the woman with the basket, a slight blush came to Lizzie's cheeks, along with a small smile. She told Sherlock he was very observant and correct in his assumption about the nutmeg. Sherlock proceeded to say the woman must be a regular to the picture palace, as she knew the films well, even the newer ones, where she laughed before certain comedic sections reached the conclusion. Coupled with the fact she'd attempted to start conversations with other cinema goers, suggested to him that she was lonely. Right again, Mr. Holmes, Lizzie said. That's Mrs. Edwards. She recently moved to the area and hasn't made any friends yet. She loves the films, especially the funny ones. She's a lovely woman, and we all like her. And the nutmeg? Sherlock questioned. Does she bring you baked treats, which are too polite to refuse? I suspect she makes gingerbread, which has the addition of nutmeg. And perhaps after eating some, you feel too guilty to partake of your sister's later, torn between loyalty to your sister and your natural empathy for Mrs. Edwards. You felt unable to say anything to either woman. Lizzie nodded and explained how Mrs. Edwards' kindness extended to all members of staff at the Picture Palace and how no one could refuse her. And yes, that was why she was too full to eat the food which her sister later prepared. She pointed to her handbag and said she had some of the gingerbread inside because Mrs. Edwards made so much of it. Lizzie looked at her sister I should have said something earlier, but I didn't want to upset you. I'm so sorry. Mrs. Pemberton's response was to place her hand over Lizzie's and say there was nothing to apologize for. She added they should invite Mrs. Edwards to their home the very next day. Sherlock left the two women to their reconciliation and walked up the stairs to his rooms. He gazed out at the tranquil sea and wondered what he would do with his day tomorrow. Still walk along the path to the lighthouse? Perhaps. But maybe the chance to solve another mystery would present itself. Maybe.